a lot of my research at the moment relates to random matrices. So a mm -hmm. matrix is a collection of numbers. Um, but mathematicians like to view that as a single object and it has various properties that one might want to um, uh, inquire about, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, for example, if it's a square matrix. Um, and I'm interested in what happens when the numbers that, that are in the matrix are random. Matrices appear everywhere in mathematics and its applications, and it's often natural to model situations, problems, where there's some inherent complexity um, by taking the matrices to, be, to have random entries. So the history of this is, um, going back to the 1950s, uh, the best theory that we have of nature is quantum mechanics, and that's um, essentially built around describing uh, quantities in terms of matrices. And it was realized in the 1950s that in complex quantum problems, the matrices look random. Um, and so the subject started then and is now a very active subject. Uh, one wants to calculate properties of matrices if you take the constituent uh, numbers in them, the elements as random. And I'm interested in applications to quantum mechanics. I'm also interested in connections to number theory. So it turns out that some of the properties of random matrices show up for reasons we really don't understand in the Riemann zeta function. And um, so I, I've been exploring that for a number of years, and that, that's the thing I work on constantly, I think about constantly. <laughs> <laughs> and I found it very interesting that you mentioned quantum and applications of what to me sounds like very much a pure maths focus. In right. some sense, like matrices, algebra, I would sort of, if we were giving things sort of categories, I would call that pure maths. Mm -hmm. And yet, you're using it in all kinds of these applied situations, such as quantum theory. I think that's a really nice lead-in to actually the Protect Pure Maths campaign, mm -hmm. which you're sort of a major part of at the moment. Absolutely. So, um, first of all, I don't, see, I don't separate out pure and applied mathematics, um, but many applications in mathematics involve quite sophisticated and subtle um, mathematical ideas. Mm. Um, and that's the beauty of it, that, that in describing the world, we often need quite rich and, and sophisticated mathematics. Um, and we, we don't know how to do it otherwise. And it seems to be the best description of nature. So quantum mechanics is a good example. In the 1920s, people were trying to understand um, the nature of uh, properties of atoms and molecules. And they found that very difficult, possible with the mathematics that had been used up until that stage to describe motion, Newton's mm -hmm. laws of motion, yeah. for example. Um, and then they discovered that they needed um, to treat collections of numbers uh, uh, as, as individual entities. Um, and they stumbled across matrices. So physicists realized this without, at that stage, knowing what matrices were. Uh, and then they found that, of course, the theory of matrices had been developed in the 19th century and was there for them to use. So when Heisenberg first developed quantum mechanics, he wasn't aware of the theory of matrices. Oh. And then he went back and suddenly realized it was all there waiting for him. Um, and so quantum mechanics developed very quickly because mathematicians mm. had developed the tools necessary. Mm -hmm. And it was the same, there's another description of quantum mechanics in terms of waves, and that was due to Schrodinger. Uh, and he, put, he wrote down an equation for quantum waves, the Schrodinger equation. And again, it turned out that the mathematics that was needed to analyze properties of that equation, the solutions, had been developed in the 19th century. Um, and so he was able to make very rapid progress because mathematicians had spent decades working out the properties of wave equations. I'm glad you mentioned the, the two ways of thinking about quantum because that's actually one of my favorite courses I teach. Mm. here at the, the university is the right. second year quantum course. I think it's a, a brilliant course to be teaching. Right, yeah. and <laughs> quantum mechanics is just such an amazing subject. Um, but going back to, uh, to what we were talking about, um, I think this, this is, these are not isolated examples. Um, there are many others. So in the, about 100, just over 100 years ago, um, Einstein developed a theory of, of gravity and uh, realized that he needed some highly sophisticated mathematics of uh, non-Euclidean geometry. 
And um, he, he, for him, this was completely new, but of course it had been developed by Riemann 60 years earlier. And this goes on to the day, to this day, that many of the wonderful applications of mathematics that, that, that are pursued really involve highly sophisticated fundamental theory, and the two are inseparable. Mm -hmm. And often uh, people are interested in modeling the world in some way, and they find that the mathematics that they need already exists, it's been constructed before, but it goes the other way around, that, that sometimes people realize that there are interesting problems out there and that inspires new fundamental mathematics. Going back to the, um, the Protect Pure Maths campaign. Yes. Even if perhaps you're not keen on the title of Pure right. Maths, let's call it Fundamental yes. Maths. It's a term that people use, so I'm yeah. happy to use it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what is the main goal of that and why, why does this sort of campaign and project exist? So the project exists because um, we think all mathematics is important. Um, it happens that recently in some places in the UK and elsewhere in the world, um, people have had to tighten their belts. Mm -hmm. And so when they do that, they sometimes look at the areas that, where the immediate payback is further, is further into the future. Um, and pure mathematics, fundamental mathematics, is like that. Often it's done and then the payback comes decades later. And it's easy to think that you can just close it down for a few years and then rebuild it, but you can't do that. There's a whole culture, there's a whole edifice that's developed. And once you stop it, it's extremely hard to start again. And what we're concerned about is that short-term decisions will be made targeting areas that have very long-term payback, like uh, pure or fundamental mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so we simply want um, decision makers to be aware of the consequences of what they might do and of the importance of pure mathematics. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think it's a really good point that often looking into something just because it's an interesting problem, mm -hmm. you don't realise, you don't need to know where it would lead. That's right. As you say, lots of these things, for example, the, the examples you've given, let's say matrices and um, Riemann geometry, at the time, they were kind of maybe like, oh, these are interesting sort of fundamental theory, almost, mm -hmm. I, w I don't really want to use the quirks, but almost like mathematical quirks mm -hmm. of like things. Yep. And then, as you said, half a century, a century later, absolutely fundamental to our understanding of the universe. So they were often developed by people, by mathematicians, who were interested in just in the mathematics. They didn't have immediate applications in mind. They were invented out of a sense of curiosity or aesthetic a sense of beauty, a sense of wanting to play a game, to, to, to establish rules and see what the consequences would be. Mm -hmm. And it's a remarkable fact about the world that often when mathematicians do this, um, driven by a sense of aesthetic or beauty or curiosity, they invent things that do decades, years or decades later, turn out to be absolutely vital. It would be impossible to do for the, for the theory of quantum mechanics to have been developed without the work in the 19th century of mathematicians who didn't know what quantum mechanics was. Um, likewise, the theory of general relativity of black holes couldn't be pursued without the work um, in the 19th and 20th centuries in geometry and topology. Mm -hmm. um, a very good example is the work of um, Roger Penrose on black holes, which makes essential use of very beautiful topological ideas that were not invented for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And a another example I would give is that in the, in the Second World War, it was realized that one could do cryptography by using highly sophisticated mathematical ideas, certainly not in invented for that purpose. And this was you know, pioneered at Bletchley Park mm -hmm. um, by Alan Turing and co-workers who, who applied mathematical ideas that People had no idea would be would be useful in this context, but turned out were. Um, and so I think the, these ideas appear all over. I'm glad you mentioned cryptography, because <laughs> of course you used to be the head of the the Heilborn Institute. Yes. Um, which I believe is links uh, mathematicians with GCHQ and the Government Intelligence yes. That's Department right. in in the UK. Yeah. So sort of. How, how was that role? How did that work? Can you tell us a little bit more within what you're allowed to tell us, I guess, yeah, yeah, <laughs> around yeah. sort of the importance of maths in sort of helping with yeah. security of, of the UK? 
So the story about Bletchley Park is pretty well known. There are mm. films about it now, and Alan Turing is rightly celebrated as a heroic figure in many mm. different contexts. Um, that work continued, uh, so mathematics, highly sophisticated mathematics, turns out to be, continued to be important in, in securing information um, and in sh securing communications. That work continued at, um, at GCHQ after the Second World War and continues to this day. GCHQ is one of the biggest employers of mathematicians in the country. Um, and the partnership that was established in the time of, the, of Bletchley Park between GCHQ and the academic mathematics community has continued. Um, and the work that GCHQ does is, is very similar to academic mathematics. It's research work, it's developing new ideas, um, it's developing them often with a very far time horizon in mind. Mm. Um, so to give one example, the very early work um, in um, public key cryptography, uh, RSA, was pioneered at GCHQ. Mm -hmm. um, when at that stage it wasn't clear, it was a very practicable um, tool. Of course, it, it has now developed into that and is used ubiquitously. Mm -hmm. um, so GCHQ does a lot of mathematics. It wants to work with academic mathematicians. Um, and the Heilbrunn Institute's um, a means for that to take place. It's a space where um, people from uh, GCHQ and similar organisations can meet with academic mathematicians, work with them. The Institute employs a large number of early career mathematicians mm -hmm. um, who, um, who split their time between the academic research that any young mathematician would do, which they uh, publish and discuss freely with everybody, and other work which um, which is more geared towards the interest of, of GCHQ. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been extremely successful. It's brought in lots of mathematicians to work for a few years uh, on problems that are highly interesting, mm -hmm. um, and which they found very inspiring. For, 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 um, and they've made a major contribution mm -hmm. through that work. So would I be right in, in thinking that some problem, let's say, or, or, or interesting thing exists within the GCHQ framework and they realise, oh, maybe we should get some outside mathematicians help and sort of would then sort of almost like bring the project to the institute who would yes. then search for relevant mathematicians mm -hmm. who could have the right expertise and be That's interested right. in the problem. That's right. It, it runs very much like an academic mathematics department, mm -hmm. uh, but the problems come from GCHQ. Yeah. Um, the mathematicians at the Harvard Institute are from the very broadest range of mathematical backgrounds mm. because one wants to set up interdisciplinary teams, one wants new ideas, not simply to pursue um, standard approaches. There are superb mathematicians at GCHQ, um, but they want to uh, interact with the widest range of mathematicians outside GCHQ, and this is a space where they can meet and interact. And I don't know how much you're allowed to tell us, probably nothing, but <laughs> I'm wondering if we have any kind of examples of specific bits of maths or areas of maths for people who maybe are watching who are thinking, I would love to do something like this within my career as a mathematician. Mm -hmm. What perhaps areas of maths are helpful? What types of problems or topics mm -hmm. might people look at if they, you know, something like this might appeal to them in the future? Well, I won't talk about the specifics of what goes on at the institutes, um, but um, it's very well known that um, a lot of cryptography now uses highly sophisticated number theory, mm -hmm. um, in particular theory relating to prime numbers and to elliptic curves. Um, so that that's it's widely known that that's important <laughs> and um, uh, that continues to be important. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many other areas of mathematics that play an absolutely key role. Um, those might be um, uh, graph theory, so, so theories of discrete structures, if you're interested in connections between people, yep. um, if you're interested in net identifying networks of people, you might be interested in the graph of Facebook connections between people yep. and analysing that. Mm -hmm. Um, so those ideas also play a very important role. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the, um, the, you'll be well aware that the, the, the major potential developments around quantum cryptography. Mm -hmm. So there are many people 
interested in, in that who come from a background of mathematical physics or quantum mechanics. Yeah. Um, and that is, um, is a very highly active area of research uh, relating to what will happen when a quantum computer is built, if and when. Yeah. <laughs> what will happen? I've, I've heard <laughs> such contrasting stories. And so, for example, is it true that if we have a quantum computer, let's say, of, of sufficient power, then it could de you know, unencrypt or decrypt all of our current methods? With, with, is that something that realistically could happen, or is that kind of science fiction? No, it's not science fiction. Um, okay. it, it could... Um, it could cause very major, profound problems for some types of encryption. Yeah. Some of the most commonly used types of encryption. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, if you're concerned about the privacy of your WhatsApp messages or, your, or other secure met methods for sending emails, you, you might be very concerned about this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, of course, a quantum computer is not yet built that can tackle real-world problems, but mm -hmm. developments are very rapid and naturally um, organizations, governments, academia want to know what will happen if one's yeah. built, so they're ready. So for anyone who's watching the video, who mm -hmm. maybe wants to help with the Protect yeah. Bill Maths campaign or get involved, is there anything that they can do or what is the, the campaign currently doing? So one of the main things is to get the message out there uh, to people who are not mathematically inspired or inclined or obsessed um, about how important mathematics is how vital it is for a modern economy to have um, a really thriving mathematical infrastructure or drive. So, um, so one thing that the campaign's doing is, is trying to inform opinion formers in the country, so people in government, mm -hmm. um, people who are responsible for major decisions, uh, local MPs, um, people who lead universities who mm. often are not mathematicians, trying to just make them aware of the importance of mathematics and what it can do um, and what it, what it has done. Um, and that, I think, has been very successful. We have, we have a number of MPs now who've shown an interest, who, who've engaged, who've asked questions in Parliament about this. A number of members of the House of Lords, um, which does have a number of mathematicians in it, um, but we're also trying to um, connect with people who lead universities who ultimately make decisions about the health of math academic mathematics um, just so that they're fully informed before they make their decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've, been, we've been involved with that and what people can do, what anyone can do, is contact their MP and say how, how much they like mathematics, how important mathematics is, um, and share with them their concern about the fact that Mathematics has come under threat in recent years. Now, it's not unique in that respect. Other, di other disciplines have as well. Um, and we're not saying that mathematics is more important than other disciplines. What we are saying is that mathematics is tremendously important. Mm. And we want people who make decisions to be fully aware of what they're doing. Um, people have, in the past, um, taken decisions that have have ha impacted on mathematics, and it's been found that it's extremely difficult to rebuild a mathematical culture. Um, I wouldn't wish to make any comparisons with the modern age, but in the 1930s in Germany, a lot of mathematics departments, which were the best in the world, mm. um, were diminished considerably, and many of those took decades, almost 100 years to rebuild. Yeah. Once you destroy something like that, it's very hard to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, um, is there a petition that people can sign? Just yes. Just sort of a, a the, first yes. simple step, perhaps, everyone can go do right now as yes. they're watching this video. <laughs> right now, you can sign up to the Protect Pure Mathematics campaign. There's a website. Um, you can contact it. You can become a supporter. And you'll then get information about what the campaign is doing and how you can help. Awesome. So you should all go and do that. <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs>